you so much for coming. My name is Sahili and I am our president. We are going to have a brief meeting before we start our fabulous program. Um, so I'm going to have our treasurer uh, pop up here. All right, so like I said, brief meeting. And now we can begin our Waco High School 150 years of achievement. Turning it over to G. Thank you. So you will see something about if you can help us with our fundraising. We certainly appreciate it. Okay, museum director hat is off. And now I will start my program about the history of Rockwell High School. Okay, well the backstory is I was all set to do this for June of 2020 because Rockwell High School was officially uh, chartered formally in 1870. So I thought, okay, 150 years, cool. But then COVID had other ideas. So all the materials went underneath the bed in the guest room for two and a half years. I got them out again because I said, well, wait a minute, 2023 is 150 years since the first graduating class. Uh, and it was two brothers who went to Yale. So we're always aimed big. But anyway, so what I want to do today is take you through the, the journey of how Rockville High School and all the many things that happened over the years. Oh, before I begin, I'm going to take attendance. Are any of you presently or have been students at Rockville High School? Would you put your hands up? Oh, thanks for coming. Any of you ever been faculty at Rockville High School? Okay. All right, well, that's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. And any, any present teachers? Okay. Well, I thank you all for coming, so we will begin to learn about Rockville High School. Okay. But yes, and our superintendent is here, too. Which we, why don't we give him a round of applause? Dr. Shirley. Okay. Well, there's always been secondary education in Vernon and Rockville, but we're going to start by going back 200 years to 1823, when the Rock Mill first opened up. From that point on, there was rapid growth in this little mill, mill community. Um, and by 18, almost before 1828, people that were living there realized that their children needed some kind of schooling. So before 1888, there was a school set up for students who second, wanted to do secondary education. Now, at that time, secondary education was a luxury for most youth. Unless young men were going to college, education stopped in grammar school, which is grade 8. As for young women, only reading, writing, and basic mathematics were considered necessary. So the first secondary education in Rockville took place in a former soap factory on Market Street. It was there briefly, and then it was moved because it was too close to a saloon. <laughs> so uh, George Kellogg kindly opened his home. His house was on Main Street and West Main Street off the corner where they on the grounds of what is now Rockville Hospital. In 1834, the school moved up to Prospect Street at Elijah Martin's house, and by the 1840s, townspeople realized we need to have a central school for all students, grammar through secondary. So the brick school opened up on School Street in 1849. It was the first school building. Uh, it had two floors designed to house all the grades, and the top floor, this was Matt, This was where the high school was, in a couple of rooms on the top floor. So this was the high school from 1870 to 1893. Now, when there had been some high school education here, but by the late 1860s, the town board had recognized we need to have a more formalized high school program. So in 1870, Principal Randall Spaulding was hired to design and implement a comprehensive course of study for high school students. So that's why Rockwell High School has its anniversary in 1870. There was the staff, was the principal, and two female assistant teachers. Um, and so the high school opened up in this section of this building. New desks were purchased for high school students with writing surfaces that lifted up, and then you could have storage inside the desk. Some members of town council worried, though, that the lids would conceal, quote, class sleepers, idlers, and mischief makers. <laughs> Fears turned out to be groundless. 
Okay, so academics. At this particular high school, there were two courses of study, Latin scientific or English scientific. School was in session five days a week. Yes, that meant Saturdays. There were no electives, no study halls, penmanship was required, and music class was offered. This is the class of 1888 as freshmen in 1884. The principal is right here. So it wasn't all just academics. There was a debating society, a literary magazine, and a student newspaper. And this next little story comes from the student newspaper that was published in the 1870s. It's about the flag competition. In the 1870s, each class had a flag embroidered with their year. In December 1877, the senior class hung their flag from the small tower near the top of the school. The junior class made several attempts over the next three days to remove the flag of 78 and replace it with the flag for 79. When the number of students involved in the scuffles for the flags grew, the faculty had to step in and confiscate the class banners. Kids were still kids. Students had fun on winter sleigh rides to Tallinn and skating parties. There was an annual picnic for the school at Snipsick Lake. In addition to picnicking, students could ride lake steamers or rent boats, and the smaller class size led to closeness and lasting friendships with classmates. Okay, this is, I like this particular picture from a map of 1877, but you can see the schools on School Street. So here is the brick school, even though for some reason it's painted white. This school will show up in 1870. This is the East School. This was built for elementary school students because of the growing population in town. But by 1890, the East School is full. In fact, the middle school age kids are on the first floor, and it will be time for a new school. And the new school will go here. And this is presently the Board of Ed administration offices, but in 1892 it became the next high school. For anybody that's not from town, School Street runs this way. This is Park Street, Talbot Park. You go down here and you go over here, and then this is where the town hall is. Okay, so by 1890, the school population is growing, and there are more students from Vernon and Rockford who want to go to high school. The curriculum should be expanded to offer courses not just to college grad students, but for those interested in careers and businesses. There is insufficient equipment and supplies for the high school courses. More faculty is needed. And the city of Rockville and local mill owners want to promote Rockville as a progressive and prosperous place to attract businesses and new residents. So now Rockville High will play a school of their own. And here's the building. It's still there today. It's a handsome Romanesque, Romanesque building. And when it was, um, when it was designed and built, this is what, how the building was laid out. The first floor has the assembly hall, the principal's office. By the way, the principal's office was at the corner, right here. So he could see what was going on outside as well as inside. There was home rooms for seniors and freshmen on the first floor, a coat room, no lockers. On the second floor, there were home rooms for sophomores and juniors the chemistry and physics labs, the library, and classrooms. And the third floor had classrooms and room for typing. There was an auditorium, a library, and space for gym classes. Now, for academics, there were three terms, fall, winter, and spring. Report cards were issued monthly. Yeah, I couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> In 1914, the, the course structure was you, had, you could do Latin scientific for people going to college, English science for students finishing their education at graduation, commercial for careers in business like bookkeeping and stenography. That was only a two-year course. And so that was what you could take in 1914. Now, this is a really cool picture because it's a rare interior view of a classroom in the 1892 high school. Here are the famous desks with the lifting lids. Some fun facts. During the 1890s, several typewriters were purchased to help students learn how to type. Classes started in physical education. The total school population reached 140 students. Classes were added in vocal music, 
drawing, fanship, and public speaking. In 1911, that was the first parent teacher night. In 1916, there was a farm mechanics course in place with instruction for students to learn how to assemble farm equipment, farm building construction, and raising and caring for farm animals and vegetable gardens. By 1917, domestic science courses were introduced. All right, a little bit about student life. School started at 9 a.m., midday break for lunch, local students walked home. Out of town students brought their lunch or ate to nearby restaurants. School resumed at 1.15 and it was done by 4.15. There were out of town students. They came from Ellington, East Windsor, South Windsor, Tallinn, Andrew, Broadbrook, Herbal, and they traveled to school by the trolley. There's a charming essay written by a young woman in 1918. People said to her, oh, it must be so much fun to go out by the trolley. And she said, well, not so much. So she told a little story about the time they came to school on a winter day. And the trolley was late and picking up one day because of rain, snow, and hail. Halfway to school, the trolley got stuck in the snow. So they sat around, they ate their lunch, they sang 49 blue bottles and a hanging on the wall. <laughs> then, after, I guess, then after that, the boys reluctantly borrowed shovels to dig the snow off the tracks. They arrived to school in the early afternoon and had to turn on and go back home. But that was a complication of, of riding the trolley. Sports was very important back then. Some sports fun facts. In 1893, the newly formed football team consisted of 16 players. In 1900, there were athletic associations formed for men and women. In 1915, the first R letters were given for team sports. Clubs. There was a debating society. Okay. I'll just go back to the other sports. There. Okay, back to sports. In 1960, the principal, teachers, and a group of students were able to get land behind the nearby East School, converted into several courts for use as tennis, volleyball, and basketball. Happily, the boys and girls team had equal time to play. By 1916, football was no longer played. In 1920, men put together a cheering section for RHS sports. In 1921, chocolate was sold to purchase equipment for the teams. Okay, clubs. There, in 1896, there was a men's debating society formed, followed by a ladies' lyceum. Debates focused on current issues, such as, should women be given the vote? Or should immigration be restricted to those who can read and write? During the 19 teens, men and women's glee clubs were started, an RHS orchestra was founded, and the drama club was organized. And you can see them dressed here for production. This is Rose and Wade's dance card. At formal dances, each young woman would carry a small booklet that listed the types of dances that the band was going to play. The dance card came with a tiny pencil attached. Men would sign their names to a space next to a specific dance, and then they'd show up to dance with a young lady. Having a full dance card with many different names was a sign of popularity. In 1896, the high school social was renamed the Junior Promenade. Each December, the junior class put on a play, followed by the promenade, which was given in honor of the senior class. Since there was no room at the high school for these events, they took place in the town hall. In 1922, Little Bit of Gold were first mentioned as school colors. Starting in the early 20th century, the Washington trip was an anticipated tradition for seniors until the mid-1950s. Once they became juniors, students raised money for the trip by having bake sales, running a food tent at the Rockwell Fair as shown, sponsoring movie nights at a local theater, and selling magazines. Over the course of a week, seniors and their chaperones traveled by train to Washington, D.C., spending several days seeing the sights of the capital. Before heading home, before heading home, they visited Washington's home in Mount Vernon. A panoramic photograph was a cherished memento of the trip. It was a beautiful scrapbook put together by Nancy Strong's camp that covered her whole high school career. She's got multiple pages on the Washington trip. She has everything. Okay. 
Now this picture is kind of, this photograph is kind of cool because it shows the schools of School Street. This is after 1893 when the high school was built. But you can see here is the original high school. There's the cupola where the flags were hung from. And then this is the largest, this is the 1892 high school. Um, and it's kind of interesting, you can see that not all this area has been developed yet. Students who attended high school during the last part of the 19 teens certainly were impacted by world events. The United States entered World War I in January in 1917 and stayed in the war until 1918. Few, there were fewer socials held as young men leave school to go to war. Students support the war effort by purchasing thrift stamps or volunteering for the Junior Red Cross. Young men joined the U.S. Boys Working Reserve to work on farms. In 1918, later that year, the worldwide influenza pandemic happens. Between September and November, Vernon and Rockville, like many communities, experienced a sudden increase in sickness and death from the disease. With no hospital in town, the high school became a temporary place to care for the afflicted. A children's ward was put into the high school. There was a tent city in Talca Park to handle the sick. Uh, the mayor sent a telegram to the state where Congress, congressional representative, we have a thousand sick people, send help. And this was affecting many, many communities. By the, by the end of November, the disease had abated and the, the uh, building was sterilized and reopened. Okay, in 1916, I started to see articles in the newspaper about the problems with the 1893 high school. The population is getting larger, and um, rooms have to be broken up to fit multiple classes into them. There's not a real gymnasium for physical education classes. They want room for new domestic science classes, so the high school is getting crowded. Somebody said, well, why don't we buy the, the Yost house across the street? and we could renovate it as classroom space for a new school. And other people are saying, why spend money on a old building? We need a new high school instead. In 1920, there are multiple furnace breakdowns over the winter, with no heat on the third floor. The furnace system fails state, ex state inspection. Introducing George Sykes, businessman and benefactor. Sykes was born in 1840 in Honley, Yorkshire, to a family of skilled woolen textile workers. His family immigrated to the United States when he was 11 years old. He started work in a textile mill at the age of 14. In 1866, at 26 years old, he came to Rockville as the superintendent of the Hockin Mill. Over time, he upgraded textile production equipment, hired more skilled labor, and implemented innovative business practices. In 1886, at the age of 46, he became president of the Hocken Mill Company, which included several Rockville mills. So the Hocken Mill Company had these five mills all in Rockville, and he was president of the whole group. He also built a beautiful home on Prospect Street. This is the home as it looked when he lived there, but I'm sure many of you recognize it as the Burke Fort and Funeral Home. So he was definitely a major leader in town. Active in town, he served as a bank director and a trustee for the Rockville Library. After his death in 1903, he left money in his will for the town to establish a school for vocational training for young men. He regretted his incomplete education and believed that a program in, for instruction in the trades would better equip local youth for finding good jobs. Okay, so we have this program of a school for young men, and the request was for $100,000 annual training school with training in drafting, carpentry, plumbing, electrical, and other types of manual labor. At the time of his death, there was not enough money to build the school, so the family and the board of trustees concentrated on growing the request. In 1907, the Sykes family gave the trust property on Park Street as a site for a future school. Between 1908 and 1923, the trust fund grew with gifts from the Sykes family, the Maxwell and Prescott families, and from investments by the Board of Trustees. Between 1917 and 1923, Town of Vernon and Board of Ed officials recognized that a new high school would be needed fairly soon. So school and city officials started negotiating with the Sykes Trust to put together a plan 
that will combine a Rockville High School for everyone with the vocational school envisioned by Sykes. At a November 1923 meeting, the proposal was presented to town officials. Here's the deal. The Sykes Trust would build a new building on Park Street site at a cost of $300,000. The town of Vernon will hire staff for the school and pay for all educational equipment and supplies. A curriculum for vocational education will be established. The Sykes Trust will give the building to the town for free use for 25 years and then with an option to renegotiate after that. In 1925, the Sykes Manual Training in High School was dedicated on January 29th in the blizzard. Classes started the following Monday. This served as the high school until January 1959. Then for a while, it was used as a middle school in junior high, and now it is the Rockville Superior Courthouse. The uh, Sykes Trust, however, is still very active, and as of four or five years ago, they gave a lot of money to Rockville High School and Vernon Center Middle School for new types of equipment and technology, so they are still fulfilling his mission of training young people in technical careers. So even though he's been gone since 1903, the trust is the gift that keeps on giving. Okay, so, Rock, so the new high school. First floor has an auditorium with sequel equal to that in town hall. There's a library, a study hall with space for 75 students, seven classrooms with 30 to 35 desks, business department who offered classes in bookkeeping, typing, and stenography. Second floor, there's 10 classrooms, including those for the science and art departments. The basement has a gymnasium large enough for two basketball games to be played simultaneously. The industrial arts department offers woodworking, plumbing, and there's a metal shop and a forge. There's a domestic science classroom in the basement of the lunchroom and the kitchens. Each floor had lockers, and there were three public phones in the main office. You can see the, um, here's the view of the auditorium and the scene of lunch. And faculty in two different years. Okay, academics. In 1925, there were four courses of study for students. College preparatory for English, which is for students who plan to attend a teacher's college or technical school. There was the commercial program for students who wanted jobs in business, and the industrial arts program. This was great because Rockville High students no longer had to go to trade school in Manchester. By 1957, there were additional courses of study. The commercial course was expanded for business careers with instruction in new technologies, such as dictation machines, duplicating machines, and addition and calculating machines. The new course offerings were home economics, for girls with classes in homemaking, cooking, sewing, child care, and consumer sciences, and agriculture. Home courses for students planning to work on or manage a farm, or for students applying to agricultural college. Okay, before I go into a little bit of academics, just show you a couple things. Here is a very rare view of the woodworking department in the basement of the Sykes building. Up here is a chemistry class taught by esteemed and beloved teacher, Lucille Cuntley. I'll mention her later. Over here is um, one of the sewing and cooking slash sewing classes. You'll notice the girls are wearing aprons with little caps. This is a cooking class, but in the sewing class, they made their aprons and caps. And I do have a cap over on one of the tables that somebody donated. This picture down here shows the business class with typewriters. It looks like people taking steno. But I want to also have you look out the window here this is the Rockville Hotel. And the side of this building faced the side of the hotel. And this could be a little problematic because students who went there at this time said sometimes teachers would pull the shades. The students could look out the window into the guest, into the rooms of the hotel. And sometimes there was stuff going on that the teachers didn't want them to see. So shades were pulled. However, things work both ways. And um, in the 30s, I was told about students. Some students realized that if you looked out the windows and looked down, you could see the bottom of the hotel and the large windows at the bottom there. That's where the kitchen was. And they could see where people were, like bread was rising or people were cooking. They would try to throw pieces of chalk and see if they could get it through the window into the food. So the pranking worked that way too. Okay. 
So anyway, so now on to just talk a little bit about academics. Um, let's see, okay, in 1936, students were allowed to walk to Rock the Library during the study hall to use the collection for research. They were warned not to hang out in the library. By 1936, students from South Windsor, East Windsor, and Warehouse Point transferred to a new high school in South Windsor. In 1937, an automobile safety movie from the Connecticut Department of Motor Vehicles is shoved to junior and senior classes. In 1941, a school-wide fundraiser takes place to purchase projectors for showing films in classrooms. The Rockville High Chapter of Future Farmers is formed in 1948. The chapter of the National Honor Society was formed in 1949. And in 1957, driver's education classes are offered to Rockville High students. Okay, on to sports. So in the 1930s, physical education offerings, boys could take volleyball, soccer, tennis, baseball, basketball, boxing, and wrestling. Girls could take basketball, rope climbing, gymnastics, and dance. Teams for boys were basketball, baseball, golf, and bowling. Girls had basketball. Fortunately, things have changed. Okay. By 1938, female cheerleaders are starting to replace the male. In 1942, the Rock Mill was torn down, and that building was at the corner of West Main and Main Street. It's, uh, and that area was cleared, and it became the recreation field. This was used by gym classes and sports teams. I'm told that girls' phys ed classes were not fans of the field. They had to change into their gym uniforms while at, at the school, put their coats on, walk down the hill through town, and go use the recreation field, and then walk back. So that was kind of, some felt rather uncomfortable. And by 1947, it's determined that the field is kind of small for, for baseball teams. You know, other teams from other areas, it's just not really particularly competitive space. Uh, in 1948, the football team is reestablished. In 1954, a girls' athletic association is organized. Girls could choose af after-school activities, such as dance, tennis, gymnastics, badminton, and volleyball. Now, in 1957, the students knew that a new high school was going to be built very soon. So there was a school-wide contest to pick a new mascot. So several choices were proposed, and the Rams were selected. The school colors were returned to blue and gold. The psych school mascot was a yellow jacket, and the school colors were black and gold. So they went back to blue and gold. Lots of clubs, which is great. The 1930s French, typing, science, art, handiworks, model club, stamp club, rifle club, 1940s, machine shop, knitting, future homemakers, chemistry, travel, the tom twirling, 1950s, chess, literary, photography, library, future nurses, future teachers, physics. 1941, the student council was established. The council selected student volunteers to serve as hallway monitors. In 1946, the student council fundraiser, it's kind of creative, items left and lost and found were auctioned off. <laughs> On to music and drama. And of course, here we have G. Pitney, The Rockville Rocket. And in his yearbook, his phrase certainly defined who he was. Life without music is not life. In the 1920s, the drama club is renamed The Moon Curtain. And you can see their picture of their play, The Haunted. There were student swing bands. In 1938, the Harmony Boys played at the Halloween dance. And in 1941, the Jive Swing and Melody Boys brought their sweet sounds to a student dance. In 1940, a Rockville High reporter interviewed popular band leader Tommy Dorsey at the State Theater in Hartford. He also got to meet teen heartthrob Frank Sinatra. In 1945, students were allowed to dance to swing and jive music in the cafeteria during lunchtime. Some senior girls kindly gave up their study halls. <clears throat> to go teach the freshman boys the latest dance steps, which I'm sure was greatly appreciated. Okay, student life. So they start to, um, the banner, which was the little, came out four times a year, the fourth issue was kind of a new one, and they would put in lots of photographs. So I got, for the time at the psych school, this is where I got all these different photographs, which you can see kids just enjoying being together. You'll notice these guys here, 
This is Frank and Joe dressed to impress. Somebody said that they came back to their 50th high school reunion dressed similarly. <laughs> So back to the, the, the banner, they would have, you know, it would be like a yearbook with student photos, class song, class will, class prophecy, class poem. In the senior class profiles in 1927, one of the things kids could write down is what were their favorite hangouts. And here are some popular ones. The movie theater, Snoopsy Blake, the soda shop, with the game, and my favorite, wherever she is. Aww. Aww. By 1928, class rings have replaced class pins. In 1932, students cast votes in school for the upcoming presidential election. At rallies, student speakers spoke for the Republican, the Democratic, and the Socialist parties. In 1943, the first pep rally is held. In 1948, a description is in the banner about initiation activities for freshmen. During the first week of school, freshies wore signs with their names, had to carry the books of upperclassmen, or wore funny hats. After the school-wide initiation assembly, freshmen were officially welcomed as members, as new students. 1948 was the first year that juniors were x-rayed during school by the visiting nurses to check for tuberculosis. In 1948, the junior prom was still held in December. Freshmen were hired as waiters. Class officers led the grand march. After the prom was over, some couples traveled to out-of-town out nightclubs. In 1949, Senior Class Day, seniors became teachers and administrators for the day. RHS closed for one day in 1949, so students could go to the Big E. In 1956, both junior and senior proms moved to April. One year, the prom was held at Northeast School. After the dance, attendees went to Caddy's restaurant for dinner. Students who lived through the Great Depression and World War II certainly were well aware of the impact of these world events. In 1935, there was a report in the alumni section of the banner about the difficulties Rockville High graduates had in finding work. Since jobs were scarce, more students stayed in high school. Certainly what was happening all around the rest of the world was a cause for concern. In 1938, there was a classroom debate. What standing should the United States take in regard to foreign affairs. The class agreed that the U.S. should stay out of foreign conflicts. This, however, changed because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The United States entered World War II in, on, January, on December 8, 1941. In January 1942, Rockville High students had their first air raid drill. In 1942, science teacher Lucille Conley attended a class offered by the War Department to learn how to treat the effects of chemical warfare on civilians. She presented an assembly on civil defense and preparedness. The banner started to publish a list of Rockville High graduates in service. In 1943, first, the first two, service, first two graduates in service died, Vincent Myrtle and Francis Brigham. 1943, Rockville High students helped the war effort by gathering scrap metal for munitions, volunteering with the Red Cross to roll bandages, serving as plane spotters or knitting, hats, scarves, and socks for soldiers. Some left school early to enlist. Dances were held during 1943 and 44 to support the war effort. The Rockville High Bond Drive raised $4,330 to buy war bonds. The last, the April edition of the banner listed the names of Rockville High graduates who died in World War II. In the post-war years, it became obvious soon that it was going to be time for a new school. As you can see, certainly the population has surged. They are using two older school buildings to cover overflow classes, lack of playing fields. There's no adjacent property for expansion. And the rising elementary school population means that it's going to be time soon to get a new school. OK. So. Um, what happened is that, let me talk about national trends. The burn in the Rockville, like many other communities, in the late 40s and 50s saw a population surge due to the baby boom. And this happened all over, the, all over the country. But in Vernon, farmland became housing developments. And families moved to single family homes in Vernon. The population in Vernon eventually surpassed that of Rockville. 
So by 1956, it's time to have a discussion about what do we do next. Various solutions were proposed. How about two high schools, one in Vernon, one in Rockville? Keep the site school, build a new high school of similar size in Vernon. Or how about one high school, large modern building for all students with enough land for playing fields? So the second choice was chosen. OK, now we're going to have one high school. Where do we put it? What about Henry Park? Well, there's not enough room, and there's traffic as access problems. How about the open land at the corner of Regan Road and South Street across from the armory? People immediately got very upset. That's near the dump. And there's a flyer, in fact, about don't build a high school near the dump. So the next property that was suggested was land on Loveland Hill. It was a farmer farm, good-sized property, and access to Route 83. So that was selected. And the contract was signed in 1957. And you can see that the cost was $1,930,669.53. Very careful record keeping. I love this little picture from the banner. It shows the high school emblem driving up the hill to the new Loveland Hill campus. And by the way, the, logo, the, band, the uh, motto for the high school was Neville DC Optimum, nothing but the best. So, okay, so now we are at the new high school. What do we got here? Okay, 39 classrooms for all courses of study, an auditorium, double gymnasium, cafeteria, kitchen, library, administration office, space for over 1,000 students. The new high school is for grades 10 to 12. Sykes School became Sykes Junior High School for grades 6 to 9. And a separate building is built for the vocational agricultural program. So is everything awesome? Well, not quite. So now we have Rockville 4.1. What happened in Vernon between 1950 and 1960 is the population of Vernon and Rockville went from 10,000 to almost 17,000, which was a growth of 67%. More single-family housing was being built. More elementary schools were being constructed. By 1962, Rockville High had over 1,000 students. They are projecting 2,000 plus students for 1970. So plans were drawn up for an additional wing. 24 classrooms, including one science room, two large study halls, two special education rooms. Sadly, the pool was deleted. And the plans were also designed so that this wing, in the future, if necessary, a second floor could be constructed. So, I, so that, was the, that was approved by town council, and the cost of this new addition was $1,195,000, and it was done, and students were in by the fall of 1964. Is everything good? Well, not quite. In 1968, more concerns about need for another high school. Okay, so Rockville High is designed for 1,000. In 1968, there's 1,764 students. They've gone to double sessions. For those who don't know double sessions, you basically split the school population in half. Two grades come early in the morning to about midday. The rest of the other grades come midday to the end of the day. Things are they are shortchanged. Nobody's happy, but you got to do what you got to do. So based on current enrollment trends, they are looking at 1970, 2,000 plus students, grades 9 to 12. 1977. 3,000 plus students, 9 to 12. What are we going to do? OK, possible solutions. One, build a second high school so both schools can house grades 9 to 12, use site school and VCMS, which have already been built, as middle schools for 6 to 8. Two, convert VCMS into a new high school, keep sites as a middle school, build a new middle school on the VC, VCMS property. Number three build a large enough addition to the present Rockville High School that so grade nine can return. So they went with option number three. That was decided in 1969. In 1970, they purchased additional land near Rockville High School for expansion for the project. Then it took a couple of years as various, various proposals were put out and evaluated, reviewed. So eventually, it boiled down to the final plan. Add a second floor with 45 classrooms, Remodel the library, add on to the VOAG uh, building, have classrooms for industrial arts, special ed, and a second floor greenhouse. Eight new science labs, one of which is pictured there, 
ca expand cafeteria space, not to, do not fund the renovation to the gymnasium or, or auditorium at this time. So that's put on the back burner. But no more double sessions. The cost was $5.1 million, and in 1976, Rockville High School opened. And things were pretty good for a while. The anticipated surge of enrollment did not happen, so they were able to use this facility for a while. But as we get into the 21st century, things are coming up. Um, you can see there's some issues with the building itself, crumbling facade, windows leaking, the heating system needs an upgrade. They should get back, they should indeed update the auditorium and gymnasium. The current entrance is kind of hard to find. And there are concerns about, sadly, about building security. So this needs to be addressed. And the building was not fully handicapped accessible. So the uh, 2004 the school superintendent presented a plan to town council, construct new auditorium, move the school entrance to the front of the building facing Loveland Hill for security purposes and a less awkward location, expand the kitchen facilities, upgrade the gymnasium and locker rooms, improve and expand athletic fields, heating system, window replacement, 100% handicap accessibility. Voters approved this and through 34 million point six was spent on these improvements and it opened in 2008. And I've been to the auditorium recently, it's beautiful. Okay, so this is, the, we're gonna enter the fun part of the program. I wanted to kind of explain why, we were in, why the high school was in four different locations. And it has been at this present location over 60 years and I went through the yearbooks and, and pulled out an assortment of photographs. What I want to do now is just get a few from each decade to kind of talk a little bit about the decade, a little bit about some of the things that are unique to that, that particular time period and some things that are timeless. So this is kind of a just rolling through the decades. So starting with the 60s, and I don't know how many of you remember the gym suits, but girls were required to wear these lovely fashionable items to gym. And we have one on display if you want to bring back a bad memory, but it's what you had to do. Now they can, well, when my daughter went to school in the 90s, she was able to wear her own clothes. That was good. Okay, the scene after school. This is kind of a cool thing. This is from 1968, and this is a computer dance. And what they did was, several weeks before the computer dance, students paid $1.50 for a ticket and they received a questionnaire and an answer card. After the answer cards were filled out, they were collected and sent to a computer company in Boston for tabulation. At the dance, each person received an envelope with two cards. One had a number for that person to wear, the other card was the number of their ideal dates. And so this way you had to go look for your date who was looking for you. This guy didn't really like the numbers on his cards, he wanted those girls. So, um, anyway, um, and this was kind of a cute thing from the newspaper, contest for the favorite beetle. I was not able to find out who won. On to the 70s. So the senior, seniors get their own special lounge, which I believe is still in place. So that's kind of a cool thing for kids to be able to privilege of being a senior. Now, Rockville High is kind of unique in having a mascot an actual living mascot. There is a ram that is cared for by the vocational agricultural students, but sometimes the ram can't meet everything. So it's good to have somebody who's willing to wear the ram costume. So we have Pam the Ram in 74. Now this is from the student handbook about use of the phone in the building, and this goes under the category of my how things have changed. Students have always loved the phone, but it's, it's just totally different now. This on to the 80s. Uh, what's kind of nice about your books in the future is they start to have more color pictures, which make them very visually appealing. In the 80s, there's a dating game fundraiser, which was a lot of fun, and kids, kids still love their music. This is kind of cool, kids dressing up in cosplay, dressing up as your favorite um, fantasy character. Hot spots, hangouts in 1986. Uh, I'm not sure why Reservoir Road was a hot spot, and this barn I don't know about, but Paul's Pizza is still there, and I, but I don't think these, well, there's still McDonald's, but it's interesting, some things stay the same, some change. On to the 90s, 
The Vocational Agricultural Program is, is really a special bonus for Rockford High School. As I recall, there's one VOAG program in each county, and Rockford was selected to have the one for Tallinn County. And students from other towns can come to school at Rockville High for the VOAG program. And Rockville High students themselves can take courses at VOAG courses, even though they aren't um, the VOAG students. So that's just a real, real positive. Students love to show off their musical talents, their acting talents. An outing for the paintball club in the 90s. This is interesting, where students worked in 1999. And Three of the places are still here. The other places have closed, but um, you know, I'm sure there's new places that they work now. But student work, certainly working after school is an important maturity thing for students. Welcome to the 21st century. The Rage um, Computer for Rage Robotics. The Rage Robotics team students teamed up with East Hartford High School students to design a robot to compete in state and national contests. And there's, uh, this gentleman here is an engineer from Pratt Milky who worked with the kids as a mentor. Every year there's Spirit Week and there's homecoming events. Spirit Week is each day of Spirit Week was a different theme. Like in 2004, you dressed up in Hawaiian, or there was Twin Day. There would be other ones where you could dress as a sports team. It kind of creates a whole sense of spirit. And then usually the end of Spirit Week is the homecoming and the pep rally and the bonfire. So it's just kind of a fun way as you go through the school year. Certainly a memorable experience each year. Sports montage from 2020 to 2002. Career exploration. Rockville High has had strong vocational programs for a long time, and these programs would align with local businesses, organizations, and post-secondary education programs. Students could kind of test drive something and see, do I want to do this for a career? So it's a, it's a really nice option for kids. On to the 2010s. Cupcake Wars, the culinary department puts on Cupcake Wars as a fundraiser and a chance to show off their creativity. Prom continues to be very important to kids as a rite of passage. Unified sports, sports for everyone. A very unique vet veterans appreciation program 2016. And there are several events in the yearbooks where students will put on concerts to either benefit classmates, like in 2014, or to raise money for worthy charities. Students giving back. Now here we are in the 2020s. The decade started out fairly normally. You have class day where each class dresses up kind of a different theme. The football team had a wonderful fall of 2019, an undefeated season. Beginning of 2020, people enjoyed going to the drama club's murder mystery. Rockville marching, high marching band went on the Disney trip. And then COVID. So immediately to March, everybody went into lockdown. And students in the fall of 2020 through 2021, it was very restricted about you know, when they could eventually they could come back to school. But it was not easy. And instead of showing pictures of kids hanging out within the building, the yearbook staff had people create emojis. And they put little cartoon characters of kids. Kids created their own one. They put that sprinkled around places in school. Even when they could come back to school on Spirit Week, they had Decorate Your Mask Day. Again, you know, you, you deal with what you have. And teachers and staff keep calm and carry on. There's all the staff masked. And kids are still kids. I like this thing. Some creative backpacks and all kinds of things kids could use as a backpack. So kids had hung in there and we, it's gotten a lot better, but tough, tough times for sure. Now on to graduation. Certainly an achievement at any age. During the first years of the Rockville High, of the Rockville High School locations, the, the brick school, they would have graduation on the second floor of the Methodist Church, which later became the Senior Center, and hopefully will be a theater someday. Here is an invitation from the class of 1888. Nine students graduated that year. The senior class picnic, the graduation event, was riding on the steamer on Snipsick Lake. For the second Rockville High School, Rockville High 2.0, each graduating class would pose on the front steps of the building. It was 1906. 
Graduation then was held on the top floor of Memorial Building, or Town Hall. Each graduate received a pin with their year etched upon it, and the invitations were prepared to send out to family members. For the psych school, graduation took place in the auditorium. I should mention, if you see, if you see the large S right here, that is right on the table over there. So we, we ended up when the high school no longer, when it was no longer in use as a school, we got the ornamental S that was on the curtain. Students every year would pose on the front steps of the building. This is the class of 36. This ring was donated to us, and it came with a, a neat story. This is also from the class of 1936. During that time, the nation was in the midst of the Great Depression. Since standard gold rings were too expensive for most students, the class rings were made of white gold, a less costly blend of gold mixed with nickel and or zinc. And this girl's ring used mother of pearl for the center stone. Now, in the present location, there are certain privileges seniors get. Use of the senior lounge, senior prom, class trip, and project graduation. And then often in a yearbook, there'll be a page where kids reflect on, whoa, I'm a senior. So I thought these were kind of cool as just realizing they are indeed getting ready to achieve a life, life um, goal. And class of 2021, a rough senior year, but they made it. So the big day comes, and at Rockville High, students will graduate in the courtyard in the center of the building. And two students from the junior class are selected to serve as honor guards, and they lead the class into the courtyard. Class of 2019 celebrates by throwing their caps into the air. You'll notice the nice plantings. Every year, um, students from the vocation and agriculture classes work with town employees to beautify the space. And here's the class of 2022. This has happened for quite a few years, but after the ceremony, the graduates gather for an all-night farewell party sponsored by Project Graduation, a parents' organization. It's a final time to gather together as a class and celebrate their years at Rockville High School. In closing, Rockville High has existed in four locations. Each time a new building was built or an existing one was expanded, this was done to offer students more choices in course offerings, to introduce them to modern equipment and new technologies, to encourage them to take classes to explore personal interests, and for them to become involved with the school community through participation in sports, the arts, theater, and clubs. Each of these schools was a gift to the students of the day and an investment for the students of the future. Starting with the Industrial Revolution through the Age of Information, our town has recognized the importance of education in preparing our young people to lead full lives as productive and informed members of society and as people of kindness and integrity. Well, I think the bell's going to ring any minute, so <laughs> class dismissed. <laughs> volunteers with us in the museum. She's a retired third grade teacher. So I would give her all the pictures and the captions. She would take them all, cut them out, and mount them for me. And then we put them all on the boards. So um, I couldn't have done it without her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.